plus 50. And the title of the presentation is Footsteps to the Moon, the Countdown to Apollo 11. So the series, as we've spoken about, looks at the progress uh, uh, each month up to the July 20, uh, 1969 landing, summarising the events of that particular month. And once again, it culminated in our July meeting. So we've got, we've basically been having feature meetings that corresponding to missions that took place, and tonight is Apollo 10. In between those, we've had other features, and we've had, uh, last month, we had a focus on the Australian involvement in uh, in um, in the Apollo 11 or Apollo missions and we've had a couple of other presentations on training etc so in June uh, Andrew Winnie is going to be doing a uh, a presentation on the decision to use lunar orbit rendezvous um, the architecture of the Apollo missions which end up being adopted so it's quite an interesting story and Andrew says it's like a real detective story so looking forward to that so that's June so don't miss that but tonight we look at Apollo 10. That's the logo. And uh, but first of all, we have to go back to 1969 and stand by. We're going to do that now. Okay. So I've just got the right turn off. Okay. So as we normally do, we'll take a look at the events uh, happening around the world in 1969. Uh, in May the 6th, of course, the Vietnam War was raging. So there were 34 servicemen killed and 30, 35 injured uh, when a uh, helicopter crash had a mechanical failure. Uh, Winnie Mandela, the wife of uh, Nelson Mandela, was arrested for basically violating suppression of Communism Act. She spent 16 months in prison and the US Navy Weapons Center began its classified project Gulf Q, a series of weather modification experiments in conjunction with the Navy Naval Weather Research Facility. Never knew that until I did this research, so there you go. Uh, other things that are happening in the world, uh, the 1,710,000th and last Chevrolet Corvair, it was uh, Corvair Monza, a sports car, was produced. And over in the Soviet Union, the Venera 5 uh, space probe landed on Venus but ceased transmitting after 43 minutes. A US Air Force mechanic stole a Hercules from the RAF Middle Hall in England and flew the plane past the Isle of Wight in an apparent attempt to return to his home in the US. <laughs> After a two hour flight, he told his wife that he had trouble with the automatic pilot and the, cra the aircraft was presumed lost. Uh, so, anyway, he, uh, he went off the plane a bit there. Um, Mario Andretti won his first and only Indy Apples 500 race. Top 10. Where do you go to, my lovely? Where does he go to, the Beatles? I know. The Beatles have dropped right down to number 10. Poor old Beatles. But look at those classics. Proud Mary, Credence, the Hollies. There we go. Anyway. Okay, let's look at spacecraft. That's what we're really here to talk about. Okay, so May the 1st, the Apollo 11 spacecraft assembly is hoisted for mating to launch vehicles. So, once again, May of 69, Apollo 10 hasn't launched yet, on the 1st of May anyway. Uh, the Apollo 12 uh, first stage was just delivered, all wrapped up nicely. The Apollo 10 was on the pad at 39 We we saw that last month, and they did their countdown demonstration test, they're running through the whole launch procedure, etc. Uh, looking beyond Apollo 10, workers were preparing for the rollout later in May of the Saturn V for the Apollo 11 mission, out to 39A. Apollo 10 was on 39B, as you might recall. They connected the spacecraft to testing. Elsewhere, the VAB, they were stacking the Apollo 12, etc., and the upper two stages were on the way. So a lot of stuff happening around the VAB. Um, during the de countdown de demonstration test, managers gave the final approval to fly a colour television system on the command module in Apollo 10. Engineers modified a black and white Westinghouse camera with a colour wheel. And uh, they even added a little monitor. So that's, uh, that's your GoPro in 1969. <laughs> Wouldn't want to be strapping that to your forehead. Uh, okay, so Apollo 10, uh, May 18, they were going to go. So here's Tom Stafford wearing his suit, getting shown a pennant. 
Snoopy uh, and Charlie Brown were the mascots for the Lunar Module and Command Module. And they were preparing, preparing to leave the manned spacecraft operation building. You can see them with Snoopy, and then they're off to the pad there. So, they finally launch. Apollo 10 is off. 12.49 p.m. The first launch uh, from Apollo, uh, from Pad 39B at the Cape Complex 39. And the only man launch. From 39, of the Saturn V. From B. Yeah, but they did shuttles from B. And the only man launch. They did man flights from Man-to-pilot. B. Man Apollo. Oh, Man Apollo, yeah, yeah. Do they, the Saturn 1Bs went off A, did they? For, um, no, the one A is for Skylab. Mm. So which which pad the, did they use? Uh, yeah? Tim would know that. Yeah, the milk stool. Yeah, mm. Okay, um, May the twentieth. Okay, they just cleared the way with uh, Apollo ten, and uh, a couple of days later, out rolls Apollo eleven. So they got all the bits and pieces. They have got the latest cars and the helicopter and things. They're ready to go. So you can see pushing up the uh, slowly. You can see all the Nice smoke from the engines, the diesels. So that's out to 39A. 25th, uh, with Apollo 10 the way back and Apollo 11 being ready, the Apollo 12 commander was practicing EVA activities in the vacuum chamber. Okay, so we're just looking at administrative type things. Now, May the 2nd, a temporary fix to provide. Uh, S2 stage early centre cutoff was made for Apollo 10 and 11. So the, you might recall Apollo 9, they had a problem with that. Uh, so they were trying to eliminate these oscillations of the centre engine. Um, so they were making plans to incorporate the permanent fix into Apollo 12. So it was a temporary fix for 10 and 11, and um, Apollo 12 was going to have the permanent fix. Uh, May the 8th, uh, program, Apollo Program Director Sam Phillips suggested that uh, a meeting be held during the period of the return to flight to Earth to review the status of experiment support facilities and overall plans for science support missions during the lunar missions. May the 9th, uh, you can see how they're looking at, there's so many things happening, and they're looking at uh, a plan for the Apollo 15 uh, lunar, surface, uh, lunar surface science project, uh, looking at the LSEP array, so basically they uh, they wanted a replacement for that because uh, it was an issue for it. The 15th, May 15 go ahead, they could be made one year from that date to deliver the to the experiment package. So you can see they're looking way ahead of, you know, trying to get up to the moon. So a lot of stuff going on. May the 13th, a NASA policy released of manned spaceflight communications with outline. Policy released all air-to-ground conversations in real time, however, if circumstances arose in which a crew or mission director requested private conversation the public information officer responsible for the mission commentary would be notified and would monitor the conversation with the mission director. A summary would be released at the discretion of the public affairs. Tapes of the air would not be released. May the 20th, the head of the Soviet Cosmonaut Corps, Nikolai Petrovich Kamin, Kamin, notes that the Apollo 10 mission is 10 times greater achievement than the Venera missions being trumpeted by the Soviet media. So they were having these individual discussions. Where's Eagle, by the way? He's been big afraid. Hmm. He'd know all about that. Twenty uh, seventh of May, Apollo Program Director Sam Phillips again wrote to, to Manned Space Flight Center regarding the flight readiness review action on the translunar injection dispersion. So, basically, um, what they were looking at what what the possibility of using manual control if if there was a problem with the automated system and whether it would be acceptable. So he stated that fuel reserves of Apollo 10 were such that the dispersions seemed acceptable and he would have permitted the use of the manual guidance if the TLI, if it had been needed. However, he pointed out the margins of Apollo would be uh, much less uh, and it would be necessary to reduce the dispersions or limit the use of the capability. So obviously the thinking ahead of what could possibly be going wrong. 27th. Uh, Marshall Space Flight Center is authorised to proceed with the development of a manned lunar rover vehicle uh, beginning in 1971. Meeting was scheduled for June 6 in Washington to establish the requirements for the development of the vehicle. All right, let's have a look at the, uh, the mission. 
We've got this direct from NASA just, just two days ago. May 18th, 1969. We were almost ready. Man had orbited the moon once. Man had test flown the lunar module, the lunar landing craft, in Earth orbit once. But before we would commit men to a lunar landing, there were still a number of things to be worked out. This was the mission of Apollo 10. In the words of its commander, Tom Stafford, to sort out all the unknowns and pave the way for a lunar landing. It was a veteran crew. Spacecraft Commander Tom Stafford had flown on Gemini 6 and 9. Lunar Module Pilot Gene Cernan had flown with Stafford on Gemini 9. John Young had been on Gemini 3 and Gemini 10. They would face problems on Apollo 10, problems that would be solved for Apollo 11. Most would be minor, but they would be solved. Stafford, Young, Cernan. They brought to their mission enthusiasm, dedication, responsibility, even amazement. And through the means of color television, they took us with them as they played their part in man's greatest adventure. We are go for a mission to the moon at this time. Tom Stafford reports they are go. We're coming up in the 20 second mark. T minus 20 seconds and counting. 17 seconds and counting, guidance internal. 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9. We have ignition sequence start. Engines on, 5, 4, 3, 2, all engines running. Launch commit, liftoff. We have liftoff 49 minutes past the hour. on the second stage. Man, that station was quite a sequence. Just like old time, it's beautiful out there. You got sound ecstatic. Man, this is the greatest journey. Apollo 10 was headed for its initial parking orbit around the Earth. After the checkout in orbit, it was time for TLI, Translunar Injection, the burn of the S-4B engine to send Apollo 10 to the moon. Uh, Roger, 10, uh, you're dope for TLI, uh, S4B's looking as planned. Right on. Seco! Roger, Seco. We confirm the cutoff. Apollo 10, with a perfect burn, was on its way to the moon. Now, the command and service module separated from the S4B and turned around to dock with the lunar module. For the first of many times, Tom Stafford turned on the small, high-resolution color television camera and shared with the people of Earth the spectacular sights of outer space. Apollo 10 took along all those who had made and were making the conquest of the moon a reality. Charlie, we can't be more than about five, ten feet away. Roger. Uh, 10 is looking real stable to us. We show you closing finally. Be docked in a second, I hope. Roger. Uh, 10, uh, Houston, uh, you're looking good. We can see the uh, markings in the rendezvous with it. It looks like you just docked. Roger, how are you? Capture. You haven't fired yet. Roger. Snap, snap, and we're there. Got two grays. Roger. You saw the docket, Charlie. Gene, we can read the uh, numbers on the LAM uh, docking window. 
During the docking, Apollo 10 encountered its first problem. The mylar containing the insulation on the spacecraft hatches had broken, releasing a snowstorm of fiberglass in the zero gravity. Hey, we're going to have a heck of a cleaning job here. They had insulation all in the seal, all in the valve, and it's really a heck of a mess up here. For Apollo 11, it would be fixed. Then we watched as they pulled free of the S-4B and got our first live color pictures of the blue planet Earth. Charlie, this is, it, 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 uh, it's so hard to describe. You can go right up past Alaska and you can see the polar caps. Uh, it, it's incredible. Well, we see it all here, Gene. Its uh, colors are really beautiful. That's great. And, and the blackest black that you ever could conceive is the setting for all this. Right. So Stafford, Young, and Cernan began their coast away from Earth their speed continually dropping as the arms of Earth's gravity tried to pull them back. To control the temperature of the spacecraft, they performed a slow, steady rotation. Yeah, it sounds like shortly we'll soon be about 55,000 miles out, huh? Yeah, that's right. Sounds like a long way from home, Joe. It was time to continually check the trajectory and the spacecraft. The command module, call sign Charlie Brown, the lunar module, Snoopy. It was time for conversation, and it was time for showing the people at home on the Earth what space travel is like. And it's here for one side, you have your choice. If you don't like things right side up, you can go upside down. I just do whatever he says. So Roger, down here. <laughs> okay, we got one of you in each direction. That's the only way to fly. Farther and farther from Earth, Stafford, Young, and Cernan flew on their wingless flight. Now, off the rotating home planet, day and night became only a progression of minutes as the spacecraft rotated at three revolutions an hour. They're about to finish that diambule thing, and we're going to sock out. Today and tomorrow, we should be around the moon. Right. concentrate on finishing things that you have already started. Today's pace will be moderate. Use this time to take inventory. John Young, you will have a slow day today. This will give you time to concentrate on the work ahead. You will enjoy your surroundings and companions. And uh, Gino, your horoscope reads, give careful thought to your working and driving habits. Do something nice for your friends. The crew of Apollo 10 was getting ready for lunar orbit. Checklists gone over, clocks synchronized, computers updated. As the time for the lunar orbit insertion burn neared, the men in mission control concentrated on their displays. Houston, Apollo 10, uh, just tried looking out as far as I can out of the top hatch window. Still can't see the moon, but we'll take your word if it's there. Over. It's there plus 60 miles. No guarantee on that. Apollo 10, Houston, uh, two minutes to LOS. Uh, everybody here says Godspeed. Okay, and we'll see you right on the other side in orbit. Uh, Roger. LOS, loss of signal. The burn to place the spacecraft into lunar orbit would take place behind the moon, out of contact with Earth. Later, a second burn would make the orbit circular, 60 miles above the moon. The flight controllers waited for AOS, acquisition of signal. We have AOS. Hello, Apollo 10, Houston, over. Uh, Roger, Houston, Apollo 10, you can tell the world that we have arrived. How's the uh, view, 10? Charlie, it might sound corny, but the view is really out of this world. For the second time, three Americans orbited the moon. The electronic senses of Miss Finn, 
the manned spaceflight network followed their flight, measuring precisely their orbital path, information vital to the success of the first manned landing. On the first orbit, the crew turned the TV camera on the scarred lunar landscape. See the sea of crisis up here? That's the first real thing I'm positive of that I've seen that I recognize, and boy, it really uh, stands out. Stafford Young Cernan, a quarter of a million miles from Earth, 60 miles above our desolate satellite. time for lunar module pilot Gene Cernan to crawl into the lunar module called Snoopy to check it out for the next day's descent. His evaluation? And I personally am very happy with the fella and I hope we can give you as good a report tomorrow. Hey, you bet your life. Hey, you watch Snoopy well tonight and uh, make him sleep good and we'll take him out for a walk and let him stretch his legs in the morning. Oh, okay. The next day, Stafford and Cernan were in the lunar module. John Young in the command module called Charlie Brown. They checked out Snoopy for the last time. One of the items involved venting the tunnel connecting Snoopy and Charlie Brown to make sure that the spacecraft hatches did not leak. This was a real problem. The vent pipe seemed to be clogged. However, the hatch integrity was checked by reducing the pressure in the lunar module. The inability to reduce pressure in the tunnel also caused a three and one half degree rotation between the two spacecraft. Not enough to endanger undocking, but for Apollo 11, it would be fixed. Okay, Charlie Brown and Snoop, uh, three minutes uh, going over the hill. you go for undocking, and we'll see you around the other side. Roger. Roger. The undocking took place behind the moon. When contact was reestablished, Snoopy and Charlie Brown were ready for the separation maneuver prior to descent. The word from John Young and Charlie Brown was... You'll never know how big this thing gets when there ain't nobody in here but one guy. You'll never know how small it looks when you're as far away as we are. Hey, John, if you get a chance, you can turn on the radar transponder and we'll correlate the VHF ranging with it. Okay, my transponder is on. Transponder is on and the test switch is in operate. I should be getting a radar signal here and I sure don't. An electronic piece of radar equipment in the command module was not functioning. Without it, there would be no rendezvous and no low orbit descent in the lunar module to the moon. In mission control and in the two spacecraft, switch positions and procedures were rechecked for the descent and subsequent rendezvous were the heart of the Apollo 10 mission. From mission control, one last ditch instruction was sent up. Uh, Roger, uh, re how about trying to recycle the uh, power switch, uh, Charlie Brown? In the command module, Young turned the switch off, then on again. Hey, that did it, you guys, it's on. Hey, and I got signal strength, old buddy. What do you know about that? A little thing, a stuck switch, but for Apollo 11, it would be corrected. 
Okay, Jose, say adios, and we'll see you back in about six hours. Bye. Have a good time while we're gone, Dave. Yeah, don't get lonesome out there, John. And don't accept any TEI updates. Houston, uh, 45 seconds to uh, LOS. Uh, you still go uh, for DOI. DOI, descent orbit insertion, would come about 180 degrees from landing site 2, the primary site for Apollo 11. According to the inexorable laws of celestial mechanics, this burn of the lunar module descent engine would put Stafford, Cernan, and Snoopy less than 10 miles above the site. Once more in mission control, they waited for word from the moon. Houston, Houston, Charlie Brown. They're down there among the rocks, mumbling about the boulders and things right now. Eight miles above the surface, 35,000 feet over the ancient hills. Then a communications problem. Contact with Snoopy was reestablished through Charlie Brown. Hello, Houston, Houston, this is Snoopy. Right, Snoop, go ahead. We is going, we is down among them, Charlie. Roger, I hear you weaving your way up the freeway. Uh, Roger, fantastic, Charlie, fantastic. Right. Charlie, bad, fantastic, babe, really. of the mission. Tom Stafford describes the landing site selected for Apollo 11. Yeah, okay. The approach in looks a lot smoother than some of the orbiter photos show. It's still estimate 25 to 30 percent a semi-clear area, so if uh, the limb has enough hover time, at least from what we can see at 50,000 feet, it should not be a problem. Or if you come down in the wrong area and you don't have the hover time, you're going to have to shove off. Now it was time to begin the rendezvous. On this first low orbit, they would make the initial burn to put Snoopy and Charlie Brown into the proper phase relationship for the coming maneuvers. Okay, we're burning, John, we're burning. Snoopy was now ready for the rendezvous sequence to be performed on the next orbit. Once more, they rounded the battered face of the moon. Before the actual rendezvous burns took place, the lunar module's ascent stage would have to be separated from the descent stage. But during the separation, something went wrong. Snoopy began to roll rapidly. Get out of there, babe. And that's that last attitude. That's Snoop Houston, we show you close to Gimelock. Yeah, okay, something went wild there on that stage. And we're all set. We didn't lock it. We're going ahead to the automobile. Charlie Brown, uh, Houston, they got it saving. Uh, they uh, had a wild uh, gyration, though, know, but they got it under control. It was an unexpected system malfunction. Stafford and Cernan quickly had it under control. In fact, Tom Stafford and Gene Cernan were never in any kind of danger. But for a few seconds, they didn't know that. For Apollo 11, it would be found and corrected. Now the rendezvous sequence came step by step. It was old hat for the veteran crew. 
In Germany, Stafford had flown five rendezvous, Cernan four, and Young three. So Snoopy rose up from the moon to join Charlie Brown. Hey, Joe, uh, we're about ready to dock. Stand by. Okay, John, you're into about five feet, so he's looking beautiful. Hello, it's uh, Snoopy and Charlie Brown are hugging each other. <laughs> Roger that. We heard him down here. But the day was not over yet. They still had to prepare the ascent stage and command module for their final separation. Now we're all back in the command module. The tunnel's all locked up in weird attitude and uh, standing by the step here when you give us the word. And we can go ahead and separate now, uh, Charlie Brown. Okay, Houston, we'll give you a countdown. We're all set to go for step. Give you a five count. Four, three, Two, one, fire! day, Apollo 10 stayed in orbit around the moon. The orbital deviations of Apollo 10 were being determined with greater and greater precision. On board, there was more photography, more landmark tracking and navigation. With each revolution, the figures were being pinned down closer and closer in preparation for the arrival of Apollo 11. Joe, Jack Smith, there's some very interesting looking, uh things that uh, sort of look like uh, volcanoes. There's one on the back side that, I, that if it was in a different setting, you'd call it Mount Fujiyama. I saw. But now it was time to head home to Earth. Trans-Earth Injection, the one burn of the mission that absolutely had to work. The burn that would push Apollo 10 out of its lunar orbit. Everything looks good for DEI. Uh, Roger, we'll go here and uh, we'll see you uh, on the way home. Again, this most critical of all maneuvers would take place behind the moon, cut off from earthly contact. For the last time, Apollo 10 watched the sapphire called Earth rise over a stark lunar horizon. And as they had throughout the mission, Stafford, Young, and Cernan shared with us the sights and feelings of their voyage through color television. You guys are really hauling the mail out of there. Oh, you better believe it. It's like we're climbing straight out, Joe. It's a fantastic sight. It's like we were shot straight out from the center of the moon. Uh, you're going about 6,000 feet a second. As the crew of Apollo 10 hurtled earthward, they decided to perform one more test. A test not in the original objectives of the mission, but a test that would solve a problem that had baffled space engineers for years. Somebody finally came up with the idea of using a razor and brushless shaving cream. That's amazing, Tim, absolutely. That's what the space age does for you. I tell you, Charlie, that's one of the most refreshing things that's happened in the last couple of days. That was really great. You guys really look good. Down from the moon toward the coast of Earth, Apollo 10 sped on its incandescent path toward its dawn rendezvous at sea. Problems had been met, faced, and solved. For that was the mission of Apollo 10, 
to sort out the unknowns and pave the way. But as the men of Apollo 10 were reunited with their families and friends, attention was already turning elsewhere. Apollo 11 had been rolled out to its launch pad even before Apollo 10 had entered orbit about the moon. Now it stood, pointed toward a distant lunar sea. How much we're going to progress in the future is left to your imagination. But if we harness our energies and keep our perspectives right, uh, the goals are unlimited. like a first generation of those films. I don't know whether spacecraft films, did they do any of those documentaries? I know they did a lot of films from the, from the time, but the actual, those documentaries, you imagine what they would have been like when they first produced them on the, in the, um, back in the day. Be really nice to see them. All right, so, so we're back, we're in 1969 now, so now it's time to go back, uh, back, just take a last look at their latest fashions. And, uh, and we're back to 2019. Please, please take me back. Anyway, this is our, this is, this is what we deal with. All right, so that's it. So thank you for that. That was Apollo 10. So uh, the next meeting is in um, June. And as uh, we discussed before, we're going to be having a look at the Lunar Orbit Rendezvous uh, architecture and Andrew Rennie is going to be taking that. So uh, with that, we are going to be taking. How long do you think our break should be? Short break. Short break because we're way out of time. Um, Ten minutes. Go and water the horses and all that sort of stuff. Okay, we'll see you back here in ten.